Well, we'll try this one more time and see if the mic works this time. Well, it is good to be back together to wrap up our series that we've been in called Renew the Vision. And we spent the last couple weeks since the new year talking about this, talking about what is our vision as followers of Christ. Not just what is our vision as a church. That's one thing to have a vision statement for a church as to what we feel God is calling us toward. But as Christians, as men and women who profess belief in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, what is the vision for us as followers of Christ? And so we've talked about the importance of using our lives to preach Christ, how we love God in doing so by using the opportunities that our life give us to proclaim who Jesus is and how we live our lives following his word. And last week we talked about the importance of growing in community, the importance of having a community of believers, of coming together to worship together, to praise God together, and what that looks like. And today we're going to wrap up this series looking at the last element for this time of renewing this vision of a foundational piece of living out our faith each and every day. Before we jump into that, let's pray this morning. Gracious God, we thank you so much for the chance to open up your word today. Lord, I give you praise that you have given us your words that can lead and guide us and instruct us. Lord, that we don't have to wonder what it is you want us to do in life, but you have given us clear instructions and guidance. So Lord, as we listen to your words this morning, May your Holy Spirit guide us and lead us in your path and in your will. And Lord, may nothing that I say get in the way of what you wish to declare here this morning, but may you be glorified and may your name be lifted high. I pray this in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Well, I don't know if last week you read the news at all and heard about the tragic story that happened in New York City when an apartment high-rise had a fire break out. A week ago on Sunday morning, a space heater caused a fire to start in an apartment. And soon the 19-floor apartment building was engulfed in smoke and flames. It became a five-alarm fire, and over 200 firefighters came and battled the fire, seeking to get everybody out as quickly as they could. Many were injured, and sadly, there were multiple lives lost. But as I read the story I read Mayor Eric Anderson reporting about the firefighters and about how the firefighters acted that day. He said, quote, Firefighters continued making rescues even after their air supplies ran out. Their oxygen tanks were empty and they still pushed through the smoke. As I read that, I was taken aback by their commitment, by their willingness to continue to engage with the danger that they were faced with their bravery and dedication to continue to risk their lives even when their gear wasn't working properly because they had been at it for so long, to try to save the lives of others, to try to save those who were lost in the apartments. You may wonder why I'm telling you this, why I'm sharing a tragic story like this, but as I've been working on my sermon throughout the week, this kept coming back to me time and time again, thinking about these firefighters and the actions that they had as they willingly put their lives on the line for those who were lost in the building. You see, today we're looking at one of the foundational elements of who we must be as followers of Christ, is that we must exist to love those who are lost, to love those who are not a part of the church, who don't know the hope of Jesus Christ yet. And reading about these firefighters made me think about, am I willing to sacrifice in order to save the lost? Are you willing to sacrifice, to put your life on the line perhaps, to save the lost? These are questions that we must be willing to wrestle with as we seek to be devoted followers of Christ. You see, we are called to love the lost. We are called to love those who are not here in our churches. And I want to suggest this morning that there is great scriptural support for this element that shows us that this is not just a one-off idea, but is a way of life that Jesus calls us as believers to. I believe that first and foremost, we are to love the lost because we see Jesus model this for us throughout his time on earth. So I want to start by looking at Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 24, and the parable that Jesus uses to show how wide the net is cast to draw people into the kingdom of God. So if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 14, we're going to be reading verses 12 through 24. 
And this is what Jesus says. It says, He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, for they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. At the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to his servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet." So Jesus here uses this parable to show those listening a couple different things. First, he's making it clear that those who perhaps would be the expected ones to be invited, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, the Jewish sect, that perhaps those may not actually gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven simply because they expect it. But that sometimes those are the ones who are invited and yet have come up with excuses as to why they will not be there. The second thing that this points out is that it can be easy to extend an invitation to those who we know will return our generosity. And that's what Jesus says right there in the beginning is that it's easy to invite those who you know will give you something in return. I think we all have been in those situations where we give a gift to someone knowing that they're going to return the favor. That's much different than giving a gift to someone who we don't know if it will be returned. We don't know if there will be a reciprocation for the gift that we have given. But Jesus tells those at this dinner that he has been invited to that instead they should invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind and that you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. You see, it's not about being repaid. The invitation that I extended is not about us receiving. It's about extending the invitation to others so that they may experience the kingdom. Our efforts concerning how we treat people should not be based off of what they can give us in return, but rather they should be based off of what we have received in Christ Jesus, grace and forgiveness and unwarranted love. The remainder of this text, Jesus gives us a parable to show two things that I really want to point out this morning. The first is that Jesus extends the invitation beyond those who we would expect him to beyond those who perhaps would have been the expected invitations of a banquet, and beyond those who lacked the gratitude that was needed. And the second thing is that there's plenty of room at this banquet. So the servant is told to compel people to come in to my house so it may be filled. You see, the invitation of Jesus is not one that is to be limited to those who we are comfortable with or to those who we perhaps want to be with us. It doesn't discriminate, but it is to be extended to all of those that we come across. As Jesus gives this parable, encouraging the invitation of all of those in the street, he is not handpicking who comes in, but it's really a broad net that's cast out to anyone who's out there, that they would be invited in. I love that part where it says that they are to compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. When you think about Jesus compelling people to come in, that his house may be filled, he has plenty of room in the kingdom of God. It's not as though there are a limited number of seats at the table, and Jesus only wants to invite a certain number of people into the kingdom of God. But he compels people to come, to join him, to dine with him. And we too, as followers of Christ, are to compel people to come to Jesus, for there is plenty of room 
in the kingdom of God. And Jesus supports the idea of going out into the world, of extending an invitation to those who are lost when he commands his disciples to do so in Mark 16, verses 15 through 16. This is what Jesus says there in Mark 16. He said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. See, Jesus again gives us an exhortation here to go, to proclaim, to give the gospel to the whole creation. We are not called to just go and share Christ with our neighbors. We're not called to just go and share Christ with the poor. We're not called to just go and share Christ with those who look like we do. But we are called to go out and to proclaim Christ, the gospel, to the whole creation, to everyone who would listen. And Jesus commands this of his followers. We see it multiple times throughout Scripture. We see it, Jesus commanding us to do this with our lives, that Jesus calls us to walk in his footsteps in this manner. And he exhorts us to this act with our lives. We've seen Jesus give a command to love the lost. But I believe that we can also gain encouragement from the way in which Jesus models this in his life and ministry. Jesus doesn't just give us the words to love the lost. He doesn't just say that we are to extend his invitation to those who are lost. But he lived it. As he walked the earth, as he came down to save sinners, he showed us firsthand what that looked like as he came to save the lost. And in how he treated those who were sinners, he showed that as well. Look at how Jesus loved the lost with me in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36, says, One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, he being Jesus. And so he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Jesus answering him said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So Jesus is here. He's been invited to dinner at a Pharisee's house. A Pharisee is one of the religious elite of the time. And so Jesus goes to his house to dine with him. And during dinner, he is engaged by this woman who most scholars think most likely was a prostitute. And Jesus shows right away that he's not unwilling to engage with those who the religious elite of the time looked down upon. Those who some would have viewed as too sinful or too far removed from society to want to even engage with. And yet Jesus doesn't view them in the same manner. Jesus engages with her in a loving manner. Look at the two responses that we see here at the table. The Pharisee right away says he, that Jesus should know who this woman is who is touching him. That she is a sinner. That's his response to this woman coming in and anointing Jesus' feet. 
is that Jesus should be aware she's a sinner and he shouldn't be letting her touch his feet. And yet Jesus shows his appreciation toward the act that she does. He shows his appreciation toward the love that she shows him. Jesus does this by using this parable of a money lender with two debtors, showing that the one with the greater debt canceled would be the most appreciative of the love that the money lender showed. And Jesus then highlights this woman's actions, the ways in which she has shown her love for Jesus in wetting his feet and wiping his feet with her hair and anointing his feet, how she has shown her love for Jesus in a way that the Pharisee never did when Jesus came into her house, into his house. And the result is that Jesus tells the woman that her sins are forgiven, for she has loved much. In this exchange, we get a glimpse of Jesus living out a love for the lost, a heart for those who are sinners. The Pharisees don't treat her the same way. They've removed themselves so much from those who have been cast aside by society that they forget the importance of loving those who are lost, of showing kindness to those who are sinners, of showing them the way to God. And Jesus models this firsthand. And this should bring us great joy because we are all sinners. You see, far too often upon coming to Christ, it can become easy for us to forget our past or forget that we too are sinners in need of Jesus' grace. What great news that Jesus loves those who are sinners. What great news for me, what great news for you that Jesus continues to love those who are sinners. So may we not forget that we too are sinners, just like the woman that the Pharisee looks down upon, but may we take Jesus' example and live out in our own lives a love for those who are lost, a love for those who are perhaps living in sin, hoping to point them to Jesus Christ, the one and only one who can forgive our sins. If Jesus has commanded us with his words to love the lost and he's lived this out, I believe that we now can honor Christ by loving the lost in our own lives. We see the truth of this in Jesus' own words in John 8, 31, where Jesus says, it says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple. You see, it's when we abide in his word, it's when we follow the word of Christ that we truly live out being his disciples. Jesus shows us here in John that we show our allegiance to him by abiding in his word. We abide in his word by following it and thus by honoring him who has given it to us. We don't show our discipleship of Jesus Christ by hearing his words and then ignoring what he calls us to do. We're saying, well, that's not for me. I'm not really gifted in that area, but I'm content to do this. We don't get to pick and choose what commands of Jesus we are to follow. The commands that Jesus gives us as followers of Christ, we are to follow all of them, not just the selected ones that work for us. In fact, in John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You see, if we love Jesus, if we are truly his disciples, we show this by keeping his commandments, including his commandments to love the lost. To say we follow Jesus yet deny his commandments shows a disconnect from what it truly means to follow Christ. When we follow Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, we give him our entire life, And we seek to live in a manner that honors him and honors the exhortations that he has given us. The Bible is clear. Jesus is clear. We are to be people who love the lost. This is to be a foundational part of who we are because it was modeled to us by our Savior. It was a foundational part of his life and ministry. It was why he came to earth was to love the lost to save us from our sins. And so we too must seek to embody this in our lives. But you may be wondering, how do we put that into practice in our lives? How do we do this here at SCOG? Well, first and foremost, I believe that if we are to love the lost, if we are to truly put this into practice, 
we must begin by realizing the reality of heaven and hell. You see, I think it can be easy for us to forget or to ignore the fact that we are dealing with a reality of eternity, that there is a real heaven and there is a real hell. One of the great quotes that came from a movie that perhaps you've not seen called Usual Suspects said, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. And there's been lots of different uh, variations of that quote, but this idea that Satan has convinced the world he did not exist. And yet we live in a culture that on the one hand seems more obsessed with demons and the demonic than ever before, and yet ignores or denies the actual existence of a real Satan and an afterlife of hell. And if we are to care about the lost, our care for them must stem from the recognition that if people don't turn to Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they will endure eternal damnation, eternal separation from Christ and from His glory, from His holiness and from His perfection. I want to start us thinking about reaching the lost from a place of concern for where they are going, not where they are currently. You see, if we aren't aware, if we don't think about the fact of where our eternity is spent, of where someone's eternity is spent if they don't follow Christ, then perhaps we will not have the urgency needed when we think about those who are lost. This fact should light a fire under us as we think about those we know who don't profess Jesus as their Lord and Savior. This isn't about just a personal preference like having someone who is a friend of yours who doesn't like Thai food and you like Thai food. This is about eternity and how it will be spent. This is about the most important matter in our lives and one that has eternal implications. And so we must start our thinking about the loss from a place of recognizing the importance of this eternal decision and that there is an eternal matter at play. This must lead us to develop a heart for the lost. There are countless stories of men and women who have had a heart for the lost, which can encourage us in our pursuits as well. John Knox, for example, stated, Oh God, give me Scotland or I die, as he sought to share Christ with those who were in Scotland. David Bernard, a great missionary to North American Indians in the early 18th century, wrote, I dream of lost souls. I care not what suffering I undergo as long as I see lost souls saved. He went on to not only share Christ with many, but also to be put to death in his 20s for sharing that faith. And yet, to him, that wasn't what mattered. To him, what mattered was to see souls saved. I believe that when we develop a heart for the lost, when this is the lens through which we see the world, it will impact how we use our time, our talents, and our resources to honor Jesus, to follow his exhortation to love the lost. Listen to how one woman wisely used what was at her disposal to impact lives for Jesus because she had a heart for the lost. A missionary to Africa told the story of an elderly woman who was reached with the gospel. Though she was blind and could neither read nor write, she wanted to share her newfound faith with others. So she went to a missionary and asked for a copy of the Bible in French. When she got it, she asked the missionary to underline John 3.16 in red and mark the page it was on so she could find it. The missionary wanted to see what she would do, so one day he followed her. In the afternoon, just before school let out, she made her way to the front door. And as the boys came out when school was dismissed, she would stop one and ask if he knew how to read French. When he said yes, she would ask him to read the verse that was marked in red. And then she would ask, do you know what this means? And tell him about Christ. The missionary said that 24 of the school boys that lady led to the Lord later would become pastors. You see, she had a heart for the lost. She was willing to use what she could at her disposal, whatever means she had to seek to share Christ with those who she could come across. If you don't have a heart for the lost, then seek the Lord in prayer today. Ask him to develop within you a heart for the lost. Ask him to help give you the ability to see others as he sees them and to let this guide you in your pursuit of loving the lost. 
The next and last thing I would encourage us in is to not give up. To not become easily discouraged and give up in our endeavors to love the lost. A couple of years ago, we had some good friends who were camping in Lapine. And their young son got lost during the night. He wandered off from the campground and they couldn't find him at about 7 p.m. And they spent all night looking for him. They brought in search and rescue teams and drones and spent countless hours looking for him. He was eventually found safe and sound. But what I noticed is that they never gave up looking for him. They never said, well, we spent enough hours and can't find him. So it's time to call an end to that search party. But they used every resource they could. Every person that they could find to join in, they spread the word around throughout the nation for people to pray for them as they sought to bring their son back to safety. They never gave up in that search. And you and I have been fortunate in the fact that Christ has not given up on us. He has never said that we are too far lost that we're too deep in our sin that he gave up on us. He continued to seek after us. He continued to seek to love us and to show us his grace in our lives. And so we too must not give up. We too must continue to push forward, to love the lost, and never give up this side of heaven in that endeavor. We can be encouraged, though, that we are not doing this alone that we are on a mission with Jesus and that he will be with us as we seek to love the lost. He doesn't leave us alone in this task. This isn't a one-man mission. It is one of the purposes of the entire church body, that we must come together to support, to encourage one another, and to pray for one another in this endeavor. I love what C.H. Spurgeon said about the fact that Jesus is with us in this mission We stated, Mark also that my master's mission, while it is a gracious one and a great one, is a very complete one. He comes to seek, that is, to find the lost. And coming into contact with lost humanity, he does not leave it lost, for he saves those whom he seeks. You see, Jesus came to save the lost. He came to bring freedom to those who are living in captivity. He came to break us from the bonds of sin. It is his mission that we are invited into as we seek to live that out in our time here on earth, as we seek to share Christ with those who are lost. We have been invited into a journey with Jesus Christ, a beautiful, life-giving journey. It is by him alone that our sins are forgiven, that we are sustained each and every day. And it is because of what we have received that we seek to share Christ with all who will listen. That we don't keep this message of hope to ourselves. That we don't receive the grace of God and let it stop there. But that we turn to those around us. That we proclaim who Christ is boldly. And that we seek opportunities to share Christ with those who are lost. If you're here today and you don't know Christ yet, or you're watching online and this is your first time hearing about Jesus Christ and you are lost, know that we care deeply for you, that the church spends a tremendous amount of energy praying for you, thinking about you, thinking of ways that we can reach you with the hope of who Christ is. And so I would encourage you to not waste any more time, to not spend any more days apart from Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior but to turn to him, to pray to him, to ask him to be your Lord and Savior and to give your life to him. And I guarantee you there will be no greater decision made in your life than to lay your life down before Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and to follow him. There is no greater joy in life than following Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Brothers, sisters, please don't go about your days living your life content to have received salvation and yet neglect to share this gift with those who still desperately need it. Take the opportunities given by the Lord to share your reason for hope. Pray for those who are lost and in all glorify Christ by inviting others into the eternal hope that you have through Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Let's pray.
Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for the gift that you have given each one of us, the salvation that you have extended to us. We are humbled by it. So Lord, may we in turn look for all opportunities that you provide to share about that grace we have received, to share about the hope that we have in you alone. Lord, may you provide those opportunities. May you guide and direct us into those conversations. And when they come, Lord, may you give us a boldness to share about you. May we not be timid in our faith, but may we walk courageously the path that you have laid before us. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your presence here with us today, for the life that you modeled for us, and for your Holy Spirit guiding us and giving us the words as we go forward. In all this, may our lives point to you and glorify you, Jesus. We love you and we praise you this morning. Amen.